Executive as well as from the National Department of Health. Mr. Malisela Ritalo is the chair of the Hospital CEOs Forum in Pumalanga, as well as the CEO of Impunga Hospital, and he will share his perspective from a hospital uh, perspective. Mr. Anele Yawa from the Treatment Action Campaign will obviously uh, provide uh, input from a patient perspective because all that we do is about patients and therefore we can never do anything without them. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, my name is Sandy Lemchongo. I'm a member of the South African Medical Association and the chairperson of the General Practitioners uh, Private Practice uh, Committee. So today's session is really focusing on um, something we don't often talk about as clinicians and as practitioners, um, what governs so that which we do, meaning uh, the resources that we have available at our disposal to provide healthcare services to our patients. So without much ado, I will just start with a bit of an opening and then hand over to Dr. Mark Bletcher, who will just share some thoughts from the National Treasury. And also after that, we will open the floor for the rest of the colleagues. For any questions that do come up, uh, colleagues and all of those in attendance, please post them in the QA session, and I'll try and accommodate as much of those uh, questions as far as possible. Um, let me ask the panelists to perhaps introduce themselves before um, we start the session formally. So let me start with you, Dr. Mark Bletcher. So um, I hope you can see me. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my name is Dr. Is, is my name is Mark Bletcher. Not sure. Yeah, the dark. Um, probably have to put off a light or anything like that. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody. So I, I work in the National Treasury in the public finance section, in which the post I'm in is Chief Director Health and Social Services. So I work quite closely with the national and some of the provincial departments of health. Uh, back to you, Chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Mark. Mr. Italo, if I can ask you to introduce yourself. You are on mute. Oh, okay. Good evening, colleagues. My name is Malisela Italo. I'm the CEO at Impunga Hospital. And as it was introduced, I'm also the chairperson of the CEO's forum in Impumalang. I'm just... Thank you very much, Mr. Litalo. Although we missed the last bit of your of your intro, um, let me ask uh, Mr. Yawa to come in and introduce himself. Uh, greetings to everybody. My name is Anneli Yawa. I am the General Secretary of Treatment Action Campaign. I am also a board member in the Office of the Health Standards Compliance. I am the user of the public health care services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yawa. Um, last but not least, I will ask Dr. Lubuyo Bayeni to introduce uh, himself. Okay. Um, may I come in, uh, Chair? I'm sorry, Dr. Lubuyo is facing technical challenges and is trying to join. Okay. We'll allow him to join when he's available. Um, thank you very much, Mtengi. So, um, colleagues, without much ado, um, just as an opening, we all understand the current um, economic challenges that the country is facing. Our tax revenues have decreased um, over years or are growing at a very, very slow rate. This has naturally reduced the fiscal space available for government spending. This includes and affects health essential services or sectors like healthcare, education, infrastructure, and many others. National treasuries in general face very difficult balancing budget in balancing budgets as the country's lo uh, low economic growth is leading to deficits, which further increases borrowing to cover this expenditure. Our high unemployment rate increases the demand for social welfare programs, such as unemployment benefits and social assistance. This further exacerbates the, the, the fiscal challenges. We know that private sector investment um, and infrastructure development has been on a decline over the last many years. And this is generally very crucial for long-term economic stability for the country. And therefore, uh, many packages of stimulating have come through. But what obviously concerns us as healthcare practitioners is the financial, is the immense impact it has 
on the on the overall system. For the healthcare sector, particularly, employment and stability becomes a challenge as the public healthcare sector faces significant financial constraints leading to hiring freezes that we often see within various departments and, 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 and facilities. And as we recently saw in some other areas where there may be reduced working hours, including overtime and so on and so forth. This instability creates job insecurity, stress um, and stress among healthcare professionals. The stagnation in, and reduction in salaries that we've seen over the last few years and reduction in benefits have become a normal reality that uh, healthcare workers have to contend with. The public sector often struggles to offer competitive, competitive packages for compensation and therefore, as it competes with the private sector, it becomes more and more difficult to uh, attract and retain skilled professionals. Despite all of this, uh, our healthcare professionals uh, always rise to meet the, the, the challenge and we do the best within the, the confines of what is available. But this comes at a huge personal cost, including burnout and stress uh, for the public, reduced access to essential healthcare services, but uh, other things that maybe we don't often talk about is reduced uh, access to innovation and technology that may be available to our patients and sp as spending is reduced. So this webinar, um, which is very well thought out, is really an opportunity for us to engage and converse. It's not about uh, blame gaming, uh, but it's the intention is really for us to actually try and actually collaborate and find solutions that actually will um, advance the health system and improve accessibility to essential healthcare services for the public within the available confines. But it is important that actually we understand that actually um, without collaboration, um, the understanding of what can be done within the available mean, uh, resources is going to be null and void. So I hope that the spirit of this debate and conversation is really going to inform um, the future collaboration that we hope to achieve through um, through partnership and through engagement and really for, uh, fostering um, a new way of doing things that improves uh, access and, and accessibility to high quality healthcare services for, for our population. Let me ask Dr. Mark Bletcher perhaps to just start by giving us a perspective. And I, I did ask Dr. Bletcher to share also the process because I think as healthcare professionals, we are very removed in general from the processes that go into the budgeting cycles, the various processes that include Treasury, National Department of Health, provincial departments, as well as parliamentary processes, so that we are actually quite clear and understand what is the background, what are the processes, and how we can participate to inform their thinking and how we can actually improve the way they, they do their work as well. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Pletcher. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm trying to share my screen so that you can see my presentation. Um, just tell me if you can see it. Not yet, Doctor. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, we can see it now. Um, just remember to full screen it. Thank you. All right, um, do you see it on full screen? Yes, we do, thank you. Okay, so again, um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, um, and I, I'm talking in a sense uh, today in a kind of uh, spirit of attempting to share and to collaborate and um, work together around, in a sense, problem solving. Okay, so you'll know that the Minister of Finance tabled the budget um, in the last week or two. Many of you will have listened to the parliamentary hearings. Um, but what I perhaps should remind you is that the provincial budgets which make up the national health budget are not yet finally tabled. So they'll be tabled in the next month or so, and we'll have more definitive numbers there. And that the numbers that the minister presented were in a sense um, projections at this point. So what I'm going to try and cover is to talk a bit about the budget process. What are the projected budget numbers and trends? What has been added and reduced? And then what causes or underlies these numbers? And talk a little bit about what can be done to achieve efficiencies at any given a budget level. And a bit about ways to intervene and give input. But again, just to stress that the final provincial budgets are not yet tabled. So what the what, what one finds in the Treasury publications at the minister table, for example, consolidated numbers are at the stage projections are based partly on meetings with all the provincial treasuries. 
Um, but for example, three to four billion per annum was, was added to the budgets in the last kind of two or three weeks before the budget. So those numbers were not yet in in some of the final numbers. So we'll still see the final exact published budgets. All right, so I have 12 slides in total. Um, I think I've, uh, this is slide number three. Okay, so this this first table on the left shows you the, the numbers that were in the budget review, the minister table, full health. This table 5.8. And what it and this is what's called consolidated expenditure, so it's mainly provincial health departments, but it also includes some other public sector spending. You can see it's by um, by areas which are particularly provincial programs. But what you'll see is a total here estimated, an estimated consolidated total of 267 billion in this year. That's the 23-24 financial year, rising to 271.8 billion to 281.8 one billion to 295.2 billion by 26 27. so we do three-year budgeting um the first year the 24 five year goes to parliament in the appropriation bill to pass in the law but we put out these three-year budgets give an indication of a likely trend over the coming three years now if you look at this in what are called nominal terms or unadjusted for inflation then you see the budget going from the system Seven billion to 295 billion. So the health budget is getting close to 300 billion a year. So it's not a small amount of, of money. And you see this growth of 3.4% per annum nominally. But now when you adjust this for inflation, that's what you see in the figure in the in the in on the right here, adjusted for inflation. What you see here is when you adjust for inflation, because inflation is running higher than 3.4%, start seeing budgets in real terms, i.e. adjusted for inflation going down for a period. So where health budgets increase for a long period, um, 10 to 15 years, and peaked in COVID in, 20, in 2021 and 21, 22, there's this period of decline. Now, Treasury doesn't use the term austerity. So, I mean, I've kind of agreed to come talk here, but, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, this is kind of not quite the language the Treasury would use, but this would be a decline in real health budgets, which I, I am concerned about. You know, I think it is a it is a worry. And when you so these numbers are adjusted by inflation. And when you adjust them further, by not just by inflation, but you also look over like a 20-year period at adjusting also for for population, that is per capita, so the real per capita strength. Again, not that they're not final. You see again, because you're bringing in this population growth, both the historical growth doesn't look as steep, but also you see a bit more pronounced uh, decline going forward. Now, something else making it look a little bit more pronounced than it probably actually is, is that the, the census 22 numbers currently have given new numbers for 22, but they have not that corrected for the last 10 years. They will do in due course. But, but here I've adjusted for the new census numbers are not that corrected. So the census had about 2 million additional population. So that affects the per capita numbers. And when those are adjusted also, there'll be a slight change in these numbers. But what you can see is that there is this period of decline we are in at the moment, which is a, which is a worry. I mean, it is a worry to me. But now, if you look at the figure at the right, so the, the blue line, and this is, this is in real per capita terms, over 20 or 25 years. And what you see here is the growth and then, in a sense, um, peaking during COVID and reduction in the provincial health budgets. Uh, and that's what you see on the right-hand axis. What you see on the left-hand axis is total government spending, excluding interest. We call that non-interest spending. And the interesting thing about this is over this 25-year period, the health budget pretty much matches the overall budget. So when... You talk about the health budget under pressure at the moment, it's the entire budget that is under pressure. You can see the health budget is following the overall budget. Now, so what underlies this problem? You know, what causes this problem? And there are obviously a number of things that do cause it. I'll try and deal with one or two of them. So the first really, really important thing that drives this problem is economic growth in South Africa. And this is showing real GDP per capita. 
and economic growth is not keeping up with population growth since the 2010 recession. So we've effectively been in a very low, South Africa has been stuck in a low growth trap for over 15 years. So when you adjust for population growth, the economy is just not growing at the level it needs to. And this low growth drives tax revenue. And the tax revenue drives the health budget, but also all the other budgets. So one of the problems is the economy. Now, the second problem is debt. So what you see here, this is this, this table on the left from the budget review. It shows all the, the, the budgets. But in, again, it's projections um, because most of the provinces haven't yet tabled. And um, it's what's called consolidated. And you, there you can see the health growth, the 3.4% growth from 267. Uh, sorry, Dr. Bletcher. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Your sound is uh, playing a disappearing act on this side. It comes and goes a lot. Um, I don't know if you can adjust your microphone on your side. Maybe it will come out clearer on this side. Yeah, I'm going to stop my video for a moment. Maybe that will help. Yeah, you can try it now. Thank you. All right. So what you see on the table here again is the health budget growing from 267 billion to 295 billion at 3.4 percent over three, three to four years. But at the bottom here, you see debt has become higher than health. Uh, the, the, the interest payments that government pays on government debt, this year, the 23-24 year, the year that's just finishing, is reaching 356 billion. So it has overtaken health at the 267 billion. And if you look at this over a longer period, in the figure on the right, uh, in real terms, that means adjusting for inflation, you can see the health budget um, you know, growing and then peaking and then slightly reducing. But what you see is this massive increase in government payments on debt. And this is the second problem. So we have low growth, which makes it difficult, which affects the tax revenue. And then government borrows to try not to cut the departmental budgets too much. But then the interest payments on the debt grow. So there's a problem of interest payments squeezing out the rest of the spending. So you see debt growing by 7.3%, whereas health grows by 3.4%. So that's a second underlying problem. Okay, so now this, this slide shows government's main tax revenue and spending, which uh, can be called the fiscal trends. So this, this um, uh, blue line, is a 25-year trend in real terms, 1.5 trillion rand in government tax revenue, just for inflation. And you can see that, that it, it grows, it goes down in COVID, but it grows fairly slowly. And when you adjust this for inflation, it hardly grows. And what you can see is that government spending is quite far above the revenue line. And that difference between what government spends on services more than the revenue is called the deficit. And we, we spend about 300 billion more than we get in on tax revenue every year, 287 billion in the out year. And at the bottom here, you see this growing problem of the interest payments, which is you know, exceeding 300 billion rand now. And that is squeezing out this lower line, which is the, the government total spending, all departments um, excluding the interest. So as the interest goes up, the rest of the spending goes down. So there's this crowding out problem. Okay, and then if we look at health share of total interest spending. So health share over the years has remained fairly constant at around 13 to 14% of total spending. Some of you will know there's an African declaration called the Buja Declaration, which suggests that health budgets should reach about 15% of the total budget. So we're not that far about that on that, and South Africa does fairly well on this particular score. Now, I do need to stress that the budget process is competitive. So departments and sectors compete against each other. And over recent years, we have seen some sectors that have increased. So for example, there's been a lot of pressure after like two, three million people lost their jobs in COVID to put in place new grants in social development, like the Social Relief of Stress Fund. And it's been very difficult to get rid of that grant. You'll know the fees must fall movement and the pressure in the universities led to big increases in the NS bus budget, the increases in the water budgets, and they reduce us to certain sectors like defense, the, uh, the governance cluster and some departments. So 
overall health shares remain fairly constant, while a couple of others have gone up and a couple of others in a, a long-term period, over like a 10-year period, have gone up and some have gone down. Now, if we come to the budget 2024, the budget 2024, which the minister just tabled, faced a big problem with tax revenue reduction. And this was, this was made public in the medium-term budget policy statement. And this was driven partly because of COVID. They, I mean, the COVID economy um, shut down the economy for several months. Um, and because tax revenue was, was reduced by 50 to 60 billion and, and interest payments were higher, it made it a very difficult budget. Despite that, this budget actually ended up having net additions to the health sector. So, so although, and what this, this figure at the bottom shows is that the health line received increases in red and decreases in black, that there was a net gain of about three to four billion in health budgets um, in budget 24. So in budget 24, the health sector did not actually lose funds, it gained funds by about three to four billion. We still have to see the final published provincial budgets that might be slightly higher than that. Now, so remember, these are projections. We are awaiting this publication of the provincial budgets. We are awaiting parliamentary approval of the appropriations bill and ADORA. Um, the increases pertained particularly to funding the 23 wage agreement. Remember that 7.5% wage agreement from last year. And health is only one of three sectors that received this increase. I mean, for example, my section of the Treasury also has to oversee social development. And I mean, the provincial social development department did not get a wage, it was not funded for the wage increase. So they had to find the money for the wage increase from their own budgets, which is very difficult for provincial social development departments. So health is one of three sectors that did actually get quite a number of billions uh, for the wage increase. So why do we get a situation where we add three to four billion a year, but you still get, get net real reductions in health budgets? And this is driven mainly because post COVID, there were quite big reductions in the 2021 budget escalating over a three year period. So some of these reductions are coming through from before and adding the three to four billion does not fully offset that. Okay, so what is the net effect of this? Again, we need to see the published provincial budget. So far, despite adding three to four billion per annum, I think we, we and we're getting this, as, as I told you, we're projecting nominal growth. That means um, not adjusting for inflation of about 3.4% per annum, but real, that means adjusting for inflation. I think we're going to end up with re real reductions of around six billion going into next year, which is a reduction of about two and a half percent per annum. From, from the current year to the year starting now, 1st of April, or about double that over two years. In other words, from the past, over the past year, because the past year has been a tough year. And I think we're gonna, we still don't have the final numbers for the current year. But I think when we end up putting together the numbers of the past year and this year, we may end up with reductions of around 10 to 12 billion or 5% of the total health budget. You saw that in that real and real per capita slides I showed you earlier. So this does suggest that 24-25 is going to be, is still going to be a tough year for this for the health sector and for many other sectors. Now it's very important in a in a climate of tough budgets to talk about efficiencies because there are various approaches to dealing with tight budgets and different managers tend to deal with this in different ways. Some managers deal with this in very badly and they and they and they make general across the board cuts and they don't plan the reductions well. And this really tends to harm services. So I really want to suggest all colleagues, wherever you're located in the system, keep trying to find opportunities to do things better, ways to do things better, to, to you know, opportunities to do things better. Poor mixes of inputs and not manage, ma matching resources to workloads can lead to inefficiencies. One needs to look for innovations. And in some settings, management weaknesses definitely can be improved. I mean, a typical example of this is, you know, one goes to a theater, the doctor's available in theater, but they say there's no gases or there's no nurse. So the theater slate ends up getting canceled. So that's a huge inefficiency because it's wasting the doctor's time. 
So one's got to try and structure these things in a way that where budgets are tight, how does one maximize the outcome one can get from the, from, from the situation? Okay, last thing, this is my last slide for now. So the budget process is a cycle over six or more months. There are, there are uh, uh, function groups, departments uh, table budget bids around June, July. There are bilateral meetings. There are meetings cross-sectorally. There's a medium-term expenditure committee with heads of different departments. There's a minister's committee of the budget, which is various ministers. Um, the medium-term budget policy statements in October gives kind of due warning six months of, in advance on the next budget. Cabinet approves the budget. And currently, the minister tables it in February, then goes to Parliament, where it's sitting now. So currently, there are parliamentary hearings by the Appropriations Committee on various budget bills, like the Appropriations Bill. And today, for example, various stakeholders provided input. And SAMA, for example, could provide input to Parliament because the the budget is not law until Parliament uh, passes the law. And SAMA is a powerful stakeholder. So their input, I think, would be really appreciated, for example, in that forum. The Budget 24, in conclusion, was a difficult budget because of the revenue decline, the tight fiscal framework, and the, the 2023 wage increase. There are opportunities for working better together and to achieve better value for money. Um, but we do need to remember health budgets are approaching $300 billion per annum. So how can we collectively use that 300 billion per annum to do more? Thank you very much. Back to you, Chairperson. Sorry if I've gone on too long. Thank you, Dr. Bletcher. Um, there was, um, uh, you can take off your presentation, um, really insightful and, and I think informative for, as I said earlier on, most of us who are um, operating in the health space don't obviously uh, are not always aware of the processes and uh, and some of the challenges that actually inform some of what we see um, in the final publications. But um, let me maybe divert my attention slightly um, towards uh, Mr. Lu uh, Dr. Lubuyo. Um, welcome, first of all, um, and I'm appreciative that you had uh, technical challenges earlier. What, what does this mean, uh, particularly for the uh, Department of Health, and um, particularly when one focuses, uh, I mean, the one thing that we've got to appreciate is obviously the allocation of the, for the, or the accommodation of the wage uh, agreement uh, from last year over the next uh, MTEF. But what does, what does it mean? Because uh, what Dr. Bletcher is, is really sounding for us is that in real terms, the budget is actually uh, declining. So, the a big part of the budget, even at the provincial level, is really a workforce. What does it really mean? And what are, what are your thoughts around um, initiatives that actually, as, as Dr. Pletcher said, that actually make sense, increase output, but um, not undermine uh, healthcare service delivery that uh, from the department you, you, you would be thinking around this point? Um, thank you very much, uh, Turk. I hope I am audible and visible as well. Yes, you are. Go ahead. And please, just for, uh, for the sake of the audience, please introduce yourself as well <laughs> so they so you know you better. All right. Um, thank you very much, colleagues. My name is Dr. Luvuyo Payeni. Um, I am a Chief Director at the National Department of Health. The portfolio that I'm responsible for is referred to as the Human Resources for Health which in the main uh, covers planning and policy, uh, training and development, workforce management, including foreign workforce, as well as the human resource information system. And um, that's basically the, the, the magnitude of the portfolio. And um, I've just uh, joined last year, July, uh, coming from Eastern Cape, having serviced Eastern Cape um, since community service up until the office of the MEC at some stage. I'm a product and a member of South African Medical Association, um, having served uh, in the leadership structures in the Buffalo Sea Border uh, Coastal Branch and uh, the HPC as well. Um, thank you very much. I hope I was not as long uh, in terms of that intro. Um, colleagues, and uh, uh, thank you as well. Um, I'm glad that we ended up starting uh, starting with uh, Dr. Mark uh, because it also helped in terms of outlining, especially the graphics that were representing the, the difference in terms of the country's uh, economic status, as well as the allocations um, and the expenditure trends as well. So I think it also summarizes and explains um, why would we be having this discussion 
in terms of trying to come up with issues that deal with austerity measures. But also, it does explain what maybe, uh, to quote my minister, uh, what he would like to refer to as chronic underfunding, um, which is a reflection of what has been happening over a certain time of years or period of years. Um, when we talk of efficiencies and probably areas of um, opportunity, maybe let me put it like that, I think most of us will agree and accept that um, public health has tried um, maybe to introduce innovations um, inter ali or, or also linked to your models of um, um, trying to introduce digitalization. Um, that was the first effort in terms of trying to get close to be efficient with the limited resources. Um, I must say, I would rather refer to it as a work in progress and um, there are lessons that we are learning from that. Um, because when you look from an, a, a perception of being operational on the ground, you would reflect back and have years where we were excited trying to introduce um, issues of telemedicine. Um, I know in the Eastern Cape where I come from, there was a demonstration linking Cecilia Makiwane in Tanzania, East London, to Butterworth Hospital in Kua and up as far as Unumtat. Um, but of course, if you go back now, you might find that we haven't moved an inch in terms of um, utilizing that. So there is that opportunity in terms of digitalization as an element of trying to um, introduce uh, other efficiencies, especially versus trying to also minimize um, an expenditure in terms of the HRH component, where you might need to be appointing in every facility, whereas you could be linking and supporting and facilities through digitalization. So that's one area that it's a work in progress and I would still entice that we embrace it and try and see how we can better support um, the department in improving that. But of course, when it comes to the issue of HRH, um, at some stage, the, if, if we are to look at the issue of training as well, especially the models that we're using, we even spoke at some stage of what we refer to as a social compact where the idea behind or the logic behind was to say, let's try and have selection of students to be funded being based on a social compact contract where the idea was to say, instead of having to plan too much on recruitment, which has got its cost to have people come and service our areas, let's rather recruit people to, to further assist in terms of studying and funding from where they come from so that when they come back and qualify, it would be easier for them to consider to go back to those areas where they come from. So that was another element which was meant to ensure that we try and become efficient in terms of our human resource expenditure trends um, and try and minimize where we can save on areas such as having to recruit people outside uh, from an urban area, if I can use that connotation, to a rural area. But if you try and, and send someone to study from where they are, you expect that they would then inevitably come back. Um, we also know that um, we are also trying to ensure that there is an element of trying to make sure that we support and do outreaches in terms of the support of, especially support to the district health plan um, and district health platforms. So those are some of the efficiencies or areas of opportunity that we thought would come and meet us halfway. But I must say that um, in reality now, in terms of the National Department of Health, especially when it comes to the HRH component, we have had a gap or a, a, a backlog of um, over about seven years um, of um, trying to stabilize and strengthen our leadership, especially at the National Department of Health level, um, which has since been uh, attended to in the last uh, year. The second part was being that if you look at all our policies, especially the four policies that deal with um, the issue of retention, uh, being your committed over time, being your OSD, rural allowances, ARWAPs, and also just our own appointment in terms of um, the salary scales, um, it's policies that will date back to 2012. So it means we are sitting in a situation where in terms of even a lifespan of a policy, we ought to have been reviewing for the second time now, um, just to keep vibrant and also to keep real in terms of what is applicable and what is not. So um, we can confirm that as a department, we are doing that over and above the fact that we're having to come up with issues that deal with austerity measures. But for us, it was a question of a need um, and, and maybe a, a question of timing, which is long overdue to say that we need to be reviewing um, our policies. 
Of course, what is going to be a driving force behind all the reviewers is exactly what we are discussing now. To say, what would we be offering to come and meet halfway the austerity measures that are there? But importantly, the last slides um, that was there from uh, Mark, to say that what efficiencies can we try and tap on and make sure that at, the, at least at the end of the day, even if we are saying we are reviewing a uh, policies, but we do not undermine the issue of efficiencies, but importantly, we do not undermine the issue of the service delivery and compromise the platforms that we are supposed to be servicing. So the timing for us, especially in terms of um, all these um, uh, declines in terms of uh, the, 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 the budget allocation, all these need and several circulars that talk to the issue of austerity measures. Um, I think for us, it's a coincidental, but also an, a, a well-deserved opportunity to say, we want to review on one side in terms of policy measures. On the other side, we are guided and if not encouraged by Treasury and also the fiscal status of the country to have austerity measures, which means now it's a question of the two having to be brought together to say, what best can we do? From our side, can we are encouraging and looking forward to a more improved, if not a more visible, prominent, but also healthy stakeholder relationships, um, especially when it comes to the reviewal process, because at the end of the day, we do not want a situation where we are perceived to have just said and did a review without necessarily consulting. But also we do not want to be seen to give a perception that we would review and not be mindful or cognizant of what is actually happening on the ground and what the realities are there. So we've got to be able to be open to say, how can even some come to the party and to the table and bring something that we might have overlooked in terms of our own analysis and own reviews. Uh, but especially when it's things that are also factual and researched and maybe documented in terms of this is what is happening, these are the trends, these are the realities. And of course, these are the red flags that we need to be mindful of in terms of what we're doing with the um, reviews. So for us, the review process is, yes, coincidentally in, in meeting up or um, coinciding with the issues of the austerity measures, the issues of the budgetary constraint. But I think we are mindful and also are uh, prepared to, to, to accept the responsibility of saying it has been long overdue and we need to be able to, to look at how can we best um, respond to it. And, and lastly, is for us is to say, we, we have also agreed that you would not succeed in this state and, and, and this era to say you want to discuss ROAPs alone and say we'll come back for another one or you want to discuss community over time alone and come back. Because in actual fact, the essence of the four policies was at the time of their inception was to say, how can we make a healthcare worker stay and be comfortable where we would like them to render a service? So all these things talk to say, how can you best retain a health worker now offering a conducive environment entirely a conducive or an appro uh, appropriate, if not acceptable package. So that's why when we review now, we are saying we would rather term it, and we have even tried to be fancy or academic to say, um, we, we would like to say as our um, problem statement, we want to review um, retention strategies or a retention package that deals with keeping a workforce, especially in the public health, which means that we can't be uh, discussing one um, policy alone, but instead we must link them, trying to keep the and retain the workforce um, within the public service. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm very interested in what you are talking about, but I'll come back to this point because, um, you know, South Africa is a country that is very, very um, excellent at policy documentation, but uh, often uh, where we lack is implementation and execution uh, of those, especially when you come closer to the ground. So, but let's let's park this and come back to it later on because um, I want to get actually the patient's perspective. Um, Mr. Yawa, if, if you can come in here, what does this tell you and what are your concerns taking, taking now from what um, Dr. Bletcher showed us in terms of the spending um, across um, the number of, the, the, particularly the medium term expenditure framework, what it looks like and what we should be expecting? Because in real terms, we're seeing a decline per capita spending on health. The population is getting sicker. There's a, an, a, a high growth of NCDs. We still are dealing with um, a, a high, a, a, um, we are the leaders of a, a, an unwanted epidemic in HIV and AIDS. What does it say to you as a patient? What concerns you when you see these, these numbers coming through? And, um, and of course, 
the migration of healthcare of healthcare workers, particularly doctors, out of the public sector to go and, and foray in perhaps greener fields for themselves and even out of the country at times. What are your concerns and what is the impact being on the ground for patients? Uh, thank you, Program Director, and greetings to everyone. With your permission, can I switch off my video because uh, I've got some network challenges here. I think firstly, as, 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 as TAC and as well as people in with HIV and public health care users, we, we are very thankful for being afforded this opportunity to be part of this conversation. And as I have indicated earlier on that, I, I am the General Secretary of TAC, I am a public health care user, and TAC is working in more than 700 clinics in 32 districts in the eight provinces of South Africa. I think firstly, health is, is a fundamental human right, and also it is a constitutional right which was promised to the people of South Africa uh, in line with section 27 of our constitution. And as the public health care users, we, we often feel that our rights are violated by the politicians as well as those who are making policies which governs how healthcare systems and services are provided in our country. And it is against that reason as TAC we strongly believe that it is important for us as the healthcare users and health care providers to speak with one voice. Because when the healthcare providers are frustrated and working under unbearable conditions, we are the ones who are feeling the consequences of that. And it is against that reason, as TAC we are saying, we need to work hand in gloves with SAMA so that we can push back against the austerity measures. Because if we do not do that, we, we will be failing not only ourselves, but generations that will come after us, both in terms of the public health care users and the providers. In South Africa, we've got an estimated number of about 42 million public health care users. And yet we have a healthcare workforce which is less than 500,000, both uh, uh, in private and public. And at the end of the day, we see how the healthcare system of our country is on its knees. And all what is promised to our people is not adequately provided. We see the state of our hospitals. We see in our hospitals and health establishments that when, when a healthcare worker goes on pension, such posts, they feel they remain unfilled or either frozen for a very long time based on non-availability of money to hire people there. But also we see that in most of the times, uh, the infrastructure in our health establishments is, 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 is in shambles. And most of the times, the majority of the public health care users uh, are waking up as early as 5 a.m. to go in those clinics and spend long hours and services are not provided adequately because of the shortage of human resource, the non-availability of medicines, as well as medical equipment often broken and people having to be turned away because of this and that. But also, the shortage of human resource due to austerity measures, it becomes a burden to our healthcare providers. And as the result of that, they end up committing a lot of uh, uh, wrong diagnoses and they end up uh, uh, being accused of being negligent. And the huge chunk of our budget does not go to purchase healthcare services. It goes uh, to pay for these medical legal claims. And we believe that if our government can hire more healthcare workers, uh, we might reduce these uh, 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 medical negligences and we will end up not paying a lot of money. We strongly believe that uh, since we've got a constitution in our country and our rights are often violated 
I'm sure all of us will agree with me here that every time and again, when our government or the treasury thinks about budget cuts, always health becomes a victim. We can agree here that in the event tomorrow we wake up and being told that uh, SAA has closed shops, we will have many alternatives in terms of uh, getting flights to where we want to go. And if we can wake up and being told that ESCOM has closed shops, we, we have many alternatives like your solar panel, your generators. But if a person's life is lost, we do not have an alternative to resuscitate that life. It is against that background. We feel that our government does not take the people of South Africa, more, especially the public health care users, seriously. Often our government and officials of government, they take these decisions on behalf of the public health care users. But you do not see the users of the public health care around those tables where decisions are taken because we strongly believe that most of the times our government, when they talk about human re resource plan, they do not prioritize frontline healthcare workers. If you can go to all these government departments, all these offices are filled in by administrators. And when you go to our facilities, we've got a lot of shortage. And it is against that reason we think that our government needs to be reminded by some people to say we need to prioritize the frontline healthcare workers because we strongly believe that these are the cadres who are providing direct services to the people instead of those people who are administrators and who are occupying these government buildings. And the other problem that we have in South Africa, it's like we are a banana republic. We are one country that has too many departments of health. We've got 10 departments of health. And each, we've got one national and nine in provinces. And all of them have different priorities. And as the result of that, a lot of the money does not go to the purchase of healthcare services. And we, we, we believe as TAC and other public health care users that it is high time for us to take it to the streets in order for us to force our government not to continue with budget cuts on health in order for us as the people of South Africa, we can be able to realize what, what is promised to us in terms of section 27 of the constitution. All of us here, we are not living a single life issue and therefore we cannot embark on a single issue struggle. It is against that background, we are prepared to join forces with institutions like SAMA and be part of their struggles. And in return, institutions like SAMA must be able to join the struggles of the public health care users so that we can be able to push back against the austerity measure. And lastly, the other problem that none of the people who have been talking here are mentioning is around corruption within the Department of Health. We all know during the time of COVID, a lot of money was looted and that money was meant for services, but it ended up uh, uh, not going to services. And also the other problem that we have in our country is around the cadership deployment. Most of the people who've got skills are not hired. They are often overlooked and people are hired based on the membership card of a political party they belong to. And that on its own is compromising uh, the quality of services that needs to be provided to our people. If you go to Nelson Mandela Metro, you, there you've got a district health manager who has been acting for more than 12 months. And according to labor law, no employee who can be on acting more than 12 months. You've got a lot of facility managers or operation managers who are acting. And these people are, un if you are acting, you are unable to take decisive decision in terms of management as, as well as leadership in a health institution. That's why we need to force our government to heed to the call of the people of South Africa, led by the users of the healthcare services and the providers. Because if you are to go to our health establishments, as we are talking, most of our clinics, you have security guards who are carrying batons, yet our nurses and as well as the users of healthcare services are often being marked in those health, health establishments. And they many of the times, 
they are fearing for their safety. What do we say about that? And where is the money for that? But also, our government must stop this attitude of always, whenever they have problems, they tap on the budget for infrastructure. That money, if it is meant for infrastructure, it must be used to build clinics, to build hospitals, to renovate our clinics and hospitals, because as we are talking now, they are in a state of a mess. Thank you. Mr. Awa, thank you very much. I want to go back to a point. It's as if you read my mind. Um, but I, I, and and I'm I, I'm gonna direct it to you at uh, Mr. Litan. The issue of um, the never-ending leakage out of the system. One of the parts of this conversation is if we were to accept that the budget is what it is, that's all the resources that are available. A huge chunk of the budget that's made available for healthcare services actually is not directed at healthcare services or healthcare service delivery. It, in fact, actually leaves the system and is never accounted for, or it never actually makes it into the program that it is designed and intended for. So maybe my question to you is twofold. Um, is from a, a facility level, what are the strategies and solutions that you think about in terms of actually curbing corruption and in reducing unwarranted expenditure or unaccounted expenditure and ensuring that actually you implement uh, appropriate strategies? Because what we often see and we've seen in the last couple of weeks that a number of provinces over the last couple of years, in fact, healthcare workers have become actually the easiest scapegoat when actually there are, there's austerity or there's not enough resources. So the, the reduction of commuted over time and so on and so forth. But we do know that in practice, that actually is not a, a reality because those um, service provide, those healthcare providers still have to work that because patients cannot be left unattended. So what are the strategies that are effective that you can think of, one, at, at reducing and curbing um, uh, the leakage, and secondly, at implementing sustainable solutions that actually make do with, um, with whatever is available to stretch it as far as possible without compromising service delivery? No, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Mklong. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm I'm still on uh, on my cell phone. I'm still on my cell phone because uh, I I couldn't um, uh, um uh use the the laptop now. But uh, okay, thank you. We can hear you loud and clear, uh, Mr. Ricardo. So can you hear me now. No, yes, thank, we can hear. thank you very much. You know, um, I I studied my masters in Cuba. So I stayed in Cuba for close to four years uh, in Cuba doing my, my master's in, in healthcare services. Um, and I've noticed how they work uh, that side, which is very much different from us here. Uh, we will say Cuba has got a lot of, of doctors and there is a way in which they work, which make it very easier to have everybody uh, hands on deck. When we come to our our system here, indeed, Dr. Baini has indicated that we, we are having policies which we took previously, took decision upon previously, um, and they were never reviewed, some of them, which is making a problem. I'm just coming from uh, the reviews, the uh, performance reviews of the of Mpumalanga uh, uh, province. And one of the things which we we're, were looking at was the efficiencies which can be brought into the system to say, with the dwindling budget that we are having, what is it that we can do? And indeed, most of the time, we, we, we rush to say, maybe people are doing ROAPs or people are not in their institution. That's why most of our money is going out for, for litigations. But that's not the case. What we have realized as managers is that um, the attitude which is in our personnel, the burnout, the negative attitude which we see, the burnout is caused by this whole lot of work which they have to do. You can have the committed overtime, but money does not solve everything. You need to rest. You need to have time to ensure that you make proper diagnosis of, of patients whom you are seeing, to give attention to those patients. But at the end of the day, 
uh, the little people that uh, few people that we are having in our institutions cannot cope um, with what is happening. As much as there is still production which is coming in, whether the doctors whom are coming from outside whom we have sent to go and study or those who are studying within the country itself, it's 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 coming to to us. Then the issue is how do we um, strengthen what we have, the little that we have, can it really address the needs which are on the ground? Surely it cannot. It doesn't matter what type of a clinical manager or a CEO you are. When when your doctors are seeing more than 40 patients, uh, one doctor see more than 40 patients a day or so, you can imagine what quality of, uh, of treatment is being given to that. You may try to rotate them as much as you can, but ultimately they become exhausted also in terms of that. So what do we do? What 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 can we do? Um, because increasing the numbers, is it going to, to assist? If there was a budget, yes, it will assist. I I, I thought when I became the manager, I thought that the, the for example, in terms of the commuted overtime. The, the policy was to address a certain need because of that. And the more doctors you would have on your roster, the lesser the committed overtime in terms of the 80 hours, which uh, it's in group, I think it's group two or group three. You are going to have less in terms of that. But um, while we do not have those people coming in, the committed overtime, which everybody is crying about and say, we're spending more. You can monitor it as much as you can every day to see that your doctors are doing the job. But ultimately, if our clinics are not functioning very well, the STIs which are supposed to go to the clinic are going to come to the hospital on a Saturday. Who's going to see them? Once you chase them away, you are uh, denying them uh, uh, treatment. So those are the things which we are, we, we are faced with. Uh, if if uh, there was something which could be done from our our side as as CEOs, is can we go back and review the policies that we have? One of the policies was uh, the rural uh, uh, allowance, which start from twenty two percent going down. If you look at it, why was it introduced? And why are we giving bursaries? I think Dr. Bayeni uh, indicated that somewhere to say, we're trying to send students from the communities where previously there the, the, the were no doctors who were willing to go there. That's why we also have a contingency of doctors from outside the country. Now that we are able to bring in those students from those areas, um, let's let's look at reviewing some of this. We may not ultimately just remove the whole uh, rural uh, allowance, but we can look at the percentages which which we are giving, and gradually be facing some of these things out. Unfortunately, this is not what is happening. Currently, the other problem which we are faced with is a specialist. Are we training enough? To have the specialist consultant, it's it's a it's a challenge. From the meeting that we had, the reviews that we had yesterday, one of the things was to say, with the junior doctors that we are having, why are we not enticing them uh, to go and do training to specialize, and why are we not um, uh, uh, giving the specialists who are here the the controlled ARWAPs, which will assist um, uh, them in order to say, instead of a doctor dodging and not coming, let's have a control mechanism. The other thing was to say, the, the waking hours which are there, some of the doctors would say, I can come in from 10 o'clock in the morning and give you your eight hours. That is, go home at eight in the evening or so. Get, give you eight hours because what you need is 160 hours of working. Can't we introduce flexi hours also to do that? I started by saying I, I was in Cuba for four years. 
in Cuba, in some of the industries which they do, I was in Havana, they share the work. You know, they, they share the work which which one person, one of the, the jobs which one person can, uh, uh, one job can have four people who are working eight hours. Some of them, they call it undia si, undia no. That is one day on, one day off. But everybody will ultimately be be working and they will never be exhausted in terms of what we're doing. The litigations which are there in our Department of Health, what causes that? Isn't it this uh, uh, high uh, um, load of work which we are putting on, on our doctors? I think we should look at how do, how do we do that? Because that's where we're looking to say, can't we change the way we've been doing things? COVID has taught us that uh, we, we were not having people working every day. It has taught us that. Why can't we go back and say what have what we have learned from COVID? Let's use it and bring in the people. And some of this, the rural, the, the uh, committed overtime might be reduced in, in state. We bring in more people to come and work. But as it is now, the austerity measures, we are going to have to pay uh, 15 million for a doctor whom we could have paid 1.2 million. That's what we are going to, to face in the future. Thank you very much. Um, that's quite interesting uh, what you're saying, uh, Mr. Litlado. I, 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 I've got a couple of points, but I, I, I do want to come back to them. Uh, my own personal views here is that South Africa is is very hospice centric in the model of care we deliver. Um, we often prioritize, you know, uh, higher levels of care, tertiary, uh, secondary, and tertiary services. Whereas where we should be really investing a lot of effort is in primary care services, preventative care, which probably aligns with your experiences in Cuba. What um, the second thing I do want to say is uh, the artificial um, addition of of personnel is to me it doesn't make sense because um, the the International Labour Organization did a study a quantitative analysis um, in in the Western Cape a few years ago. Um, the, if you if you read that paper, the number of the numbers of hours that doctors do uh, when there's in, insufficient capacity or there's not enough doctors, especially at junior levels. Um, doing 80 hours a week, 120 hours a week. Uh, it, it's quite telling that actually by by what the system of reducing committed overtime, it's not really, I think it's an artificial system that really tries to actually man, um, make it seem like we are reducing overtime. But effectively what we are doing is that the, doc the junior doctors who often don't have choice or options are actually compelled to work longer hours to cover the, the existing gaps because a casualty, for instance, or a maternity ward or a lot of the infrastructure within a hospital cannot be left unattended. So the junior doctors bear the brunt of that system. And uh, again, for me, the, the point of prioritizing specialization when we really have a large gap in primary care services is that does not seem to marry with what we need. A lot of the care that needs to be delivered is in at district health care services and actually within um, F, um, clinic and community care centers. But I'll come back to this and give you maybe another chance to, to respond to my comments there. Um, I want to ask you, Dr. Pletcher, again, perhaps uh, uh, from a, a budgeting point of view, um, the issue of social determinants of health and also um, creating a, resi a, resi a resilient health system comes into mind. And what's the thinking? Because we saw the challenges that we faced through COVID, even though we did survive, but it, we, the country and healthcare workers paid a huge cost personally and in other ways. And we continue to pay that cost. How do you think about this now going into the future, con considering obviously the, the, the constraints that you have, how do you think about actually in, um, in the budget incorporating actually um, systems that create a resilient health system, number one? Number two, in fact, actually ensuring that we are prepared for eventualities that may come, because the, what we are certain of is that there will be other pandemics that will come in the future. And if we go through an unprepared system like we did, um, long, many lives will be lost. And the last thing I want to ask you again is the idea around corruption. Um, from a national treasury point of view, uh, what do you think, uh, are we doing enough to really cap corruption? And are there any systems that you can maybe um, help bring us into confidence that actually have been put into place to reduce the amount of um, 
uh, irregular spending that actually uh, the, the Auditor General speaks about year on year? And what would you guide um, the healthcare managers and, and provinces in terms of actually really reducing or cabbing the unwarranted expenditure? Dr. Okay. okay, okay, thank you for the questions. Um, okay, so firstly, just um, on the question of um, of social determinants of uh, social determinants of health, I mean, I think this is a very important question um, because there are many there, may, there are many social determinants of health. I mean, for example, it's very difficult to to deal with. A diarrhea if households don't have clean water and sanitation. I mean, all of us will agree to that. But, you know, if the budget steps up the spending on water um, as compared to health, then the health sector tends to be very unhappy. So that there's a bit of a trade off here in that if one is genuinely interested in looking at the social determinants of health, then one needs to look at the budgets. You know of all the sectors that that are relevant to health, and I mean that's something that I've found, you know, to be quite interesting working in the in the in the national treasury is one's constantly faced with these difficult choices because it's not just health that comes with a compelling argument. There are many other sectors which are coming on with social determinants of health, quite compelling arguments, and that's why the kind of the 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 level of the and caliber of the health arguments um, are important, but. Uh, definitely, social determinants of health very important. Okay, then on the point of resilience and pandemics, I think that's a very good point. Um, and I think we are to some extent failing in this because, you know, I think that, I think that around the world, you know, many countries threw a lot of money into, into COVID, and you know, suddenly health became the most important sector, and a lot of other spending was stopped and put in, into health. But as soon as the COVID you know, pandemic ended, many countries, not just South Africa, suddenly health was not necessarily number one of the of the pops. Although let me let me just say, because I didn't say it earlier, that in this late, the late three to four billion that was added to health budgets this year, I do want to play special tribute to the Minister of Finance, our minister, who who was really concerned to try to push up health budgets. So our minister was quite instrumental in those late increases in those health budgets. But I, I think that you are pointing to a correct area. This issue of resilience is, is very important. And I mean, I'm involved in quite a lot of international work groups, which are looking at, there's a very interesting World Bank paper, which is looking at what they call double shock, double recovery. And they're looking at across, you know, across the world, they found 55 countries whose you know, health budgets have declined after, initially went up, but have declined after COVID. Also because COVID, the problem that I alluded to of um, affecting the economy and affecting tax revenue has affected many countries. So there's 55 countries which are under quite severe debt distress and having pressures in their health budgets after COVID. And the resilience argument that you raise is quite central to this. And let me also say that, you know, given that I work on health in the treasury, you know, the role of parties like the TAC and doctor groups are really important advocates for health and for health budgets. You know, so, you know, I think we appreciate their role. Um, you know, I think if you look at the UK, for example, the National Health, Health Service in the UK, the role of activism in the UK has played an absolutely central role in keeping budgets for the NHS, NHLS protected through many ranges you know, many, many periods of difficulty. So there's no question that, you know, the role of, I mean, the role of the TSC was absolutely critical through the HIV uh, uh, crisis and have been very important subsequently. And the role of doctors have also been very important. So, you know, um, I perhaps did not stress this enough in my speech, the role of, of activism and the role of sectors pushing for the importance of the health sector is very important because ultimately, even to the cabinet, and not all the cabinet members are necessarily aware of the effects of particular budgets on particular services. So, you know, um, you know, I certainly would not be against, and in fact, would support, you know, activist groups laying out the implications of certain budgets and advocating for their sector. 
not just for the health sector, you know, for, for many sectors that it, that is important. Um, lastly, on corruption, I mean, corruption has been a real scab um, across our country and across the, the health sector in recent years. I mean, this, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the stories around, for example, that the, the, the well-known case, um, you know, in the Gauteng Hospital that's been so much in the media, um, the role of the Auditor General has been very important. Um, but there are many issues where we collectively need to work more on, on efficiency and more around uh, more around uh, anti-corruption uh, measures. And I'd really encourage all colleagues, you know, to, to also play you know, what role they can, they can in that regard. Um, also, in procurement, there's a lot of procurement that still happens outside central tenders, which is then open to open to local abuse. Um, and so I think we probably need to put more procurement through uh, cross-cutting national tenders. In general, they do um, achieve significant savings, but one's got to be cautious, of course, in, in potential corruption that, that can creep in there as well. But we definitely do need to scale up a range of anti-corruption measures. Unfortunately, we have seen corruption come into the health sector in some of our provinces, and uh, all of us need to, you know, uh, play more of a role in trying to to root out the scourge. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bletcher. Um, I, I I am trying to attend to the Q and A um, questions as well, and try and incorporate them into the debate, and um, so that um, every uh, every everybody has an opportunity to uh, to raise a question, and we'll try and our best to make sure we we attend to all of them. Um, let me come to you, Dr. Lubuya, um, just in terms of leadership and governance, because part of the big challenge that's actually coming through in some of the Q&A questions is around actually the strength of our management uh, within the facilities. How do you think about it uh, in terms of supporting, measuring performance and instituting a culture of, um, of excellence within our management structures? And, and again, actually, it's it's part of this um, continuum that actually you, you know we can't function only at the bottom or efficiency can be created at the bottom, but it's a collaborative up and down process. So, what's your thoughts around, and what are the programs that you 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 can maybe uh, just alert us to that the department is thinking around uh, ensuring uh, excellence in leadership and governance of in, at institutional level. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Babosandil. Uh, Maybe if if you allow me before the Fikenje Kule Tobuibuzi question, I would like to link it to the other comment from um, Utatu uh, Anele that was also relating to the concerns over the what he referred to as cadet ship develop, uh, deployment. Um, one, we, we, we are very much interested in actually paying a lot of focus now into the strengthening of the leadership and governance in our facilities. The expression that we have already shown, um, if, if colleagues would have observed, there was an effort by the National Department of Health in trying to support the recruitment of the central hospital CEOs, whereby we, we attempted to issue a central advert. Our intention, one, is to make sure that if Uluvio by any things he can lead Khrotesquir Hospital, he should equally be capable to lead Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital, equally capable to also lead Steve Biko. So that is the, the caliber of leadership that we want to get to, or to get to, to be at the level where, when you think of who can lead or who is leading this type of a facility, it should be someone that can be compatible to lead any one of those categories or of the institutions within that category. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to respond to the fact that we, we are trying to standardize and prevent, if not avoid, the perception of people that have been put in positions only on the basis of their association or proximity to certain people. 
Um, so, so we are making sure that we close that gap so that people who are appointed, it's because they deserve and they are competent enough to be not only leading the one particular facility they applied for, but the facilities within that bracket or within that category uh, so that we, we get the same level of competencies. The second issue when it comes to the issues of efficiencies and strengthening the, 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 the governance, clinical governance, um, we are working into ensuring that um, even clinical managers, nursing managers, as well as CEO, we are ensuring that there would be a certain level of um, not only skills, but also personal empowerment in terms of how we can manage the system. Because there is a lot of evolution, there is a lot of dynamism, and there is a lot of innovations that we expect um, to come out of this leadership. And we cannot just allow to a situation where we assume that because people have been put in position, now they can be able to deliver what is expected of them. So there is a program that we are working in. If I may be practical in terms of the approach, we have already had engagements with the National School of Governance, where we were saying that um, in our appreciation of the work that they are doing, uh, in terms of the government programs that they offer and the different modules and the And courses, we have raised a um, alteration that will talk to the needs the, and also the, the dynamism of the healthcare system. So we are working on that module um, that will be trying to come close to what can we offer our current leadership in across the board and across all the facilities so that they can be um, upskilled but also empowered uh, in terms of how they do their work. But also in terms of the other programs that we are having exposure to, one of our agenda items now is to make sure that the issue of strengthening clinical governance becomes but one of the programs that are not left behind. So there is that work that is already being done, and I'm sure it's work that you would be even coming across, seeing it either in terms of the media um, briefings by the minister or the, the, the programs or the plans that will be issued in terms of the APP, as well as the operational plans of the department. But there is definitely work that is being um, engaged and is being prepared to try and support and strengthen um, all our uh, clinical governance as a start. But we are also trying to ensure that we continue to upskill and upgrade and also make sure that even at the level of an operational manager, we need to be able to have that person empowered to understand that I am responsible to understand this web call or this jail call has got a financial implication in whatever we do. So issues of preventing and avoiding waste stages should be coming to the fore. There is a lot of work that we are also doing in trying to engage as well in terms of treasury regulations, where there are issues that we are trying to report in terms of the service providers, which maybe could be linked yet to the other concern of corruption. That the current system of three choosing three codes where it's limited and less than 30,000, or even when we have people bidding, Yes, it is a, a system that is meant to control how we access, uh, people access our um, provision of the services for us. But we are saying there are opportunities that we can improve because we have been also minimal in terms of reporting those that are rendering or giving us poor um, equipment or poor um, consumables in terms of the quality and the standard. As a result, that is one area that needs to be improved in terms of efficiencies. You cannot continue to supply a hospital with a gel code that you know you need to use four gel codes because before you can be content that the line will be running. So those are the feedbacks that we are having a way now and the system that is being developed to try and give those feedback to Treasury so that where they need to guide us in terms of saying, yes, you are submitting your code is cheap, but we've got a bad experience with you that we know in the system, whether it is another province or it's another district, but we know when you supply, you supply poor quality and it becomes very expensive for us to maintain when we get provision from you. So we are having that as a, as a, as a control measure that is being introduced to try and, and, and try and improve on the efficiencies when it comes to improving as well issues that deal with them. Um, service delivered on the ground. The other issue that I wanted to maybe share with the colleagues, um, and I'm sure uh, Mark will probably support me on this one as well, is the issue of the acting um, on two ways, how I want to, I want to respond to it. Um, the, maybe the correction one is to say, in terms of the district quoted, the person that is a district manager, there is already a senior manager in terms of their appointment. So they are not acting. They are actually full-time uh, district managers as senior managers. 
But the second thing we wanted to raise is the issue of acting in terms of responsibility. Uh, my boss usually says when he responds to this, according to Public Service Act, when you are acting, the letter that you receive says it gives you all the responsibility and the delegations to do the work that this office ought for you to do. So it is not appreciated when Luvuyo Bayen is acting. He keeps on saying, I can't make decisions because I'm acting. That is not what public service expects us to do. If you are acting, you are given the full powers and responsibilities to carry out whatever. However, we don't want to perpetuate the issue of acting because indeed you may exercise your powers now because you are there and you think that is what is right for the office. But if you are removed tomorrow, someone who is new might then decide to have a different opinion. So that is the way the problem is. But we want to correct that even if we get members that keep on perpetuating this wrong misnomer of saying that I'm acting, I can't take decisions. There is no such thing in terms of the public service. When you are acting in that position, you've got all the powers that be to make decisions in that in, in that position that you're in. Um, I, I thought I would probably just um, uh, touch on those. I think you also raised a couple of things that um, I believe it could be discussions that will be ongoing, especially with this platform and this stakeholder engagement. You mentioned that we need to have a moment where we reflect to say, in the list of the specialities that have been offered, including being supported by whether the NTSGs that we grant or the study leaves that we give, but one way or the other, in terms of the medical specialization, the department does contribute one way or the other. So I, I was happy when you were saying we probably would need a moment where we reflect. Indeed, we currently are struggling to even name, if not count, specialists in terms of emergency medicine. Yet we know that the country is inundated with trauma in the country. So, so, so it's true that we need to, at some stage, have a way of saying, colleagues, can we plan and project to say, what are the country's need? You mentioned it that we could do far much better if we could strengthen primary health care. But I'm telling you, if you go to the records of the specialists, especially those that are available in the public service that have been uh, qualified in terms of primary health care, I mean, um, in terms of family medicine, you will still have a sizable number that it's not what we deserve in terms of where we want to go. So I agree that, um, in, and especially with my portfolio in terms of planning and training, that we would need these conversations to say, where are we as a country? Um, not that we are saying there are specialties that are not important, but the question could be the timing thereof. Will they really be a priority for us as a country in the next five years, in the next 10 years? What is currently becoming the need that we need to address? So I think I would welcome those discussions and that dialogue that we need to start it. And, and I appreciate that it's also coming from us as a medical association. Thanks. I'm aware that we are uh, over our allocated time. So I'm just going to try and wrap up. And perhaps actually I will, in closing, I'll ask for a minute or a minute and a half from each of our panelists. But I'll start with you, Mr. Litlalo. But because maybe you raised a couple of, con of comments that have raised uh, a number of questions from our, from, our, from, our, from our delegates, particularly around the issue of litigation. We do know, I mean, this has been uh, in our radar for, for many years, that actually litigation is increasing and it's taking quite a significant amount of the allocated resources out of the healthcare system. But perhaps actually the, the discontent or maybe the disagreement is that we, we believe it's a multifactorial issue. And, um, and so one of the issues is staffing, but other parts of the system that might be failing. And how do you think about it perhaps in the hospital environment as a CEO as, um, or from the CEO's forum around, how do we address the multifactorial issues? But perhaps then you can just um, share some of your thoughts in closing um, uh, towards the end. No, thank, thank you very much uh, Doug, for that. Um... Let me indicate that uh, indeed the litigations are multifactorial. Some of the issues um, in terms of the litigation, it's the system issues, which uh, which is the especially if you look at cerebral palsy cases, which are there. Um, in our province, we know of which hospitals are having such cases, and we can look back and say what are the systemic issues and what are the uh, issues with the with the professional. That is what we, we also have to look at to say it is not only the professionals or the shortage of the professionals 
or the over parent work professionals who are causing those. Some of the things are systemic. Indeed, if we look at uh, the uh, primary health care as a model which we can utilize, some of the litigations can be prevented, for example. Uh, like I said, the, the, the Cuban model is based on primary health care. When you go to hospitals, you would really be very sick to be in that uh, in the in the hospital itself. I'm sure most of you would know that in Cuba, 120 households, you'll have a doctor, you'll have a psychologist, you'll have a social worker, you'll have the whole um, multi multi team which will be looking under and uh, for those. But with us, even our clinics have got shortage of of those. But if we we look at doing the outreach of clinical teams uh, to these primary healthcare sectors. It will alleviate the pressures which are at the hospitals. If we take care of um, the training, like I was indicating in terms of the specialists, that's the other thing which, which we, we need, because they will be um, uh, 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 assisting those junior doctors at all at all times uh, uh, in terms of consulting with them but we 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 definitely look to need to look at revamping the way our policies are being implemented revamping the way we are rendering services uh, particularly from primary health care level before we can even go to higher level if we do that we will be able to um, uh, uh, have more positive results than what we are having with what we are having now in terms of the little that are in the hospital, the doctors, as you have indicated, we are hospital centric. If we change that mindset, we will be able for now with what we are having to have quality. Uh, thanks, Mr. Richardo. Let me invite Dr. Pletcher um, for just your closing comments. I'm not going to specifically ask you anything, but your thoughts uh, into the future. Um, just for um, share maybe over a minute what you think, where we're going and what we need to do and uh, any recommendations um, for the healthcare sector. Okay, um, th thank you again very, very much, uh, colleagues. Um, I think the question Dr. Mtongo asking is perhaps a bit too broad to try to answer uh, comprehensively here, um, but just to say thank you very much to all the participants. Um, there are many very good unanswered questions also in the Q&A. And I think many of the speakers have, have raised very, very good points. I found the, the observations from Cuba also very interesting. Uh, but I, I think the, the multitude of, of points made here are really excellent. And I think they reflect really the importance of, in a sense, individuals, wherever we sit in the system, you know, some some sit, uh, you know, I sit working in a way on budgets, but some, you know, many of you, you know, work at the clinical coalface. And issues of cost effectiveness and quality and sitting on the maternal mortality committee, et cetera, you know, are absolutely critical to getting our system working, you know, working better, um, particularly during these times. So, you know, just appreciation to all the colleagues, um, the role we all play. You know, I think there is, there is greater a, a, a potential for collaboration between the parties and the organization. Um, I don't want to try and give far reaching recommendations here. Um, you know, I think there is room for further discussion around a range of issues. There's definitely room for a lot of management imp improvements. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think one shouldn't accept necessarily that um, um, that all decisions um, are, are necessarily right. You know, I think it's important for doctors to be working together with managers to find the best dispensation for their facilities and more broadly. But thank you very much, colleagues, and we'll talk again. Thanks, Dr. Bletchel. Uh, Dr. Bayani, let me invite you um, just in closing, uh, just a minute of closing remarks from your side. Um, thank you very much. Uh, once more, I think let's, let's appreciate the thought process that went behind hosting this webinar, the, the idea and the topic thereof. 
But secondly, colleagues, I think we have had engagements and suggestions that are really meant to improve how we can render services um, within the limited resources that we have. But thirdly, I think we were also able to spark some ideas and bring in some thought-provoking issues, which um, we would be welcoming and also try to avail us also ongoing engagements on certain issues. But indeed, there is room for us to do better, especially when it comes to the HRH component, including um, how we utilize the, um, the resources that we have in rendering still quality care that our communities deserve. Thank you. Mr. Awa, um, I want to invite you last because we are gathered here because um, of of people like yourself. Um, you, we exist uh, to provide uh, healthcare to users, and our role is to make sure that we are meeting the objective of improving the health uh, of our population. So, um, in closing, and perhaps maybe just to ask a point and direct uh, question to you: um, are, are you encouraged by? the effort coming out of the session? Are we in the right direction? Are we meeting? Are we responding um, in the manner that actually our healthcare system users actually require us to be responding? Uh, are you, uh, do you have any confidence in, in, in this regard? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, uh, as the public healthcare users, we are not happy at all. Uh, and one of the things which we think the Treasury must assist in doing is, is to make sure that uh, we review the supply chain management system because we strongly feel that it encourages wasteful and fruitless expenditure where you, you can go to pick and pay a, and, and buy a cup at an amount of 20 rands. But when you buy it through the supply chain management system, the amount is tripled to what you can get. Uh, from pick and pay and we strongly believe that system is what also puts uh, our our department to the crisis where we are in too we we strongly believe chair that wherever injustice shows its ugly head it must be fought by all means necessary as tac now we are going down to the clinics to the districts to organize and mobilize public health care users. We are not going to disrupt healthcare services in our clinics. We are going to disrupt offices where Mr. Bayeni and, and Dr. Bletcher are sitting because that's where wrong decisions are taken. And this is where we feel that we have been too patient with our government and we are going back to civil disobedience. We are going back to litigation and occupy their offices until they take decisions which will benefit the users and the providers of healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yawa. And let me thank all the panelists uh, for um, a really um, useful and engaging um, conversation. And we believe this is the start of many. I want to thank the team at the Summer Professional Affairs for putting it together and uh, all of the audience that have stayed on for uh, the extra uh, 18 minutes um, over and above what was allocated. Um, I think there's lots to be to take from this session, but uh, as we highlighted, this is actually an ongoing process. And in fact, it shouldn't be an ad hoc thing. We should be on, on, uh, engaging on an ongoing basis between providers, uh, administrators, policymakers, patient um, users, and various other stakeholders to ensure that what the healthcare system is delivering meets the objectives of improving health outcomes of the people. So without with all of that, um, thank you very much. And hopefully we will see you again at our follow-up session. And I look forward to engaging with all of you again. Uh, good night. Thank you.